So, hi everyone. Uh, in this talk, we will be talking about why Go is such a nice language to work with when it comes to d doing DevOps work. As you heard, my name is Simon, and uh, I've been working with tech for the last decade or so uh, in various forms. Currently, I'm working as an independent contractor, and I'm doing software development, training, and coaching. Uh, the last couple of years, my main focus has been on DevOps practices and uh, cloud-native technology. And if you want to have a chat afterwards, just feel free to come by or reach out to me on social media or whatever. Uh, so let me start by telling you a story. About eight years ago, I worked at a large recycling company in Sweden as an architect in their internal IT department. We as a company were responsible for running all the company infrastructure, as well as their software. And in a sense, our way of working was much like what we today would call DevOps. We built and shipped software and system solutions, but we also ran it and maintained it once it was out in the wild. And during a small project where we would switch out all the infrastructure related to telephony, uh, we had to come up with a way to fetch employee data from our Active Directory, supplement it with data from the phone catalog provided by the uh, telephone uh, provider, and then update both data sources with the new unified data. At that time, we were told by our stakeholders that it would only have to run once a week for the first three months, and that it was acceptable, maybe even desirable, that it were triggered manually. So I sat down with one of my colleagues, Klaus, who were brilliant at these sorts of things. He seemed like a natural polyglot when it came to programming, and uh, just by looking at a language for a couple of days, uh, he seemed to have figured it out. But uh, in this, this case, we drew up the architecture for the integration and decided that the easy way out was to script it using PowerShell. So. After a couple of days of tweaking and tuning, we finally got it working and shipped it to the service desk and had them schedule it for manual execution um, every Friday after lunch. Uh, at least I'm able to boast uh, that I've since learned that the scheduling was a really bad idea. So fast forward five years. <laughs> Any of you have a guess on... Uh, uh, what the situation was after that? Well, the script was still alive. Since uh, we initially implemented it, uh, it had morphed into a multi-stage execution with three or four different scripts involved. It had been scheduled to run daily uh, at lunch, fully automated, and it cost uh, the IT department hours every week to just maintain it and keep it running. The operations team kept patching it uh, just to see a new bug surface somewhere else. During one of these debugging sessions, uh, which I usually got called into as I was a partner in crime for initially creating the script, uh, me and one of the newer recruits, Jenny, uh, decided that this was to be considered a permanent solution and that, we, uh, that maintenance had gotten out of hand, that we, didn't, that we needed to do something about it. So. What were we to do to mitigate the situation? Well, uh, Jenny got tasked with rewriting the whole script in a proper language of her choice, and instead think of it as an integration service. So, as we primi prim primarily were a Microsoft shop, she decided to go for .NET. Uh, a week or so later, uh, she had it all up and running as a somewhat more fault-tolerant, typed, linted, and tested service. After that service got released to production, the cost of maintenance for the very same set of features almost instantly dropped to zero. I think I, at one point, calculated the total, total uh, cost of ownership in time during the uh, year following her, her switch, and it was somewhere around four hours for a whole year from being hours every week. Uh, this was, of course, to a high degree, the result of her being a great engineer. But also something else. 
by giving the, this piece of code the same level of scrutiny and care we would any other production code, versioning it, performing code review, etc., we essentially took it from casual one-off scripting to be a real tangible piece of working software. And this was, of course, great, especially back then. Um, but by today's standards, it would most likely have been considered mediocre at best, mostly because of all its hard dependencies on things like Microsoft Windows, the .NET framework, OLEDB drivers, and whatnot. Also, the cloud has, over the years, uh, been getting more and more attention. And I'd say that it's unlikely that anyone would be able to successfully argue that it's just fad or hype by now. And with the growing adaptation of cloud and cloud-based services, comes additional need for repeatability and predictability. Enter Go. Most of us can probably agree on uh, a bare minimum that we would like to have in place to be able, able to vouch for the quality of a piece of software. Automated code reviews and test runs are nothing new, but they can be tricky to set up for a scripted language like Bash or PowerShell. I've tried it once, and I don't really recommend it. It's uh, a mess. Um, and linting and vetting take different shapes in, uh, depending on the language. In C-sharp, for example, running analyzers in most cases, I think it's still style cop on your project, along with your test suit is a common approach. In TypeScript or JavaScript, we just lint, plain and simple. Go's approach is a bit different. The code style is, code style is not really up for discussion. Neither vet, lint, or format gives us that much room to configure uh, how the code should look. This might feel frustrating at first, especially if you're used to debating over whether you should have semicolons or not have semicolons, uh, where the squiggly brackets should be placed, etc. But once you get used to it, it becomes a real strength of the language. Uh, I can go into whatever GitHub repo uh, and just browse the code and immediately uh, feel like I understand what is happening. That is not the case with especially JavaScript, but also with C Sharp. <laughs> uh, all of these tools, they also help with one another, another thing that, uh, that is, at least to me, the most important thing in DevOps, and that is shifting things left. And shifting things left, what is that? Well, in a typical dev team, we usually organize the quality assurance efforts like this. As you can see, a lot of effort is centered around the test and release phase. This is not optimal, as the cost of re rework grows larger and larger the further away from the design phase we get. With that in mind, we want to try to shift as much of the quality efforts as possible to the left of the, of the diagram to reduce the amount of rework needed and at the same time reduce the cost. Until we get to somewhere that looks a lot more like this. And it's hardly a coincidence that so many DevOps-oriented and cloud-native projects have chosen Go as their primary language. Take, for example, Mobi, the open source container toolkit project that Docker is assembled from, Kubernetes, Prometheus, Grafana, Netflix's Chaos Monkey, I'm sure you've all heard of that, Docker CLI, ETCD, and Traffic. And as Joe Beda, one of the co creators of Kubernetes, wrote a couple of years ago, on Gopher Academy. As we made this decision, Go was the only logical choice. I maintain, I'm the maintainer of an open source project called Watchtower. It's used to automate Docker container base image updates. And something that really attracted us with, with Go was the balance between high-level abstraction and low-level explicitness, which has served us great. We get a garbage collector while still being able to choose whether to use value types or reference types, depending on the use case. And 
that developer productivity is actually a prioritized concern in Go, not just during the development, but also during maintenance, has so, uh, served us well as this is a, a voluntary project uh, with no finances to, to pay any salaries. We also get high quality Docker engine APIs available through Mobi. Because the Docker Engine SDK and the Docker API, they are both written in Go and part of the Mobi repository. And based on the problems we are solving, those APIs become really important. Being able to utilize a SDK, which is treated as a first-class citizen and used in multiple internal Docker components and tools, that's just amazing. It makes our work so much easier. And <laughs> Uh, when I prepared for another talk uh, for Go Stockholm conference uh, last year, a designer friend of mine, Emma, asked me if I wanted any graphics done for that presentation. I jokingly asked her for a gopher superhero flying in the sky, shooting laser uh, from its eyes at a server hanging in wires from a zeppelin. <laughs> she responded with this, and it has nothing to do with my talk, but I wanted to include it because it's so awesome. <laughs> So let's talk about one of the specific features that I really love about Go that makes it so suitable for DevOps work. Go build produces statically linked files. This is super sweet for DevOps, as it allows you to run a file on any machine capable of running an executable in the format you've built. You don't need to handle any external dependencies. Everything is bundled or statically linked during build time. And this results in a very small storage footprint, as everything is compiled to machine code. When I say this, people often argue that Bash, Python, and Java have the same level of cross-compatibility. In one sense, they're probably right. But they are also missing a major point. Bash and Python both introduces themselves as external dependencies. You can't actually run it until you've installed those dependencies. And what if your target deployment target is running Windows Server or a scratch image in Docker? Juggling dependencies quickly becomes a source of pain because of cross-platform limitations or version compatibility issues. This makes Go an ideal candidate for bootstrapping a new machine, as it requires no pri prior installations. And it gets better by using the Go OS and Go Arch environment variables. We may specify the target operating system and architecture for which to build, independent of the underlying platform of the machine we're compiling on. This cross-compilation support is, at least in my opinion, opinion, invaluable. This effectively allows us to build all our release artifacts in the CI using the same container or machine, if you prefer to be old school and not run containers. So, a very simple Go program, one of the best. Hello there, Go Wayfest. If we build this as a Linux binary using the Go OS environment variable, we get a ELF 64-bit LSP executable that's statically linked. This is awesome. This is on a, on a Mac, uh, Mac OS machine. The same goes for Windows. We get a P32 plus executable. For Mac, of course, as that what I'm using. For ARM, and even for 32-bit uh, Windows. How many of you remember Plan 9 from Bell Labs? Turns out we can build for that as well. Out of the box. ARM 7 something. <laughs> Uh, I think the clicker went bananas. OK. Uh, all available combinations of OSS and architectures Go is able to build for out of the box is available by running Go to this list. And that's 41 different combinations. But let's. Uh, uh, dive into a bit more complex example than our hello world. 
we import the exec package and create a command with the arguments ifconfig-a. We combine the output. And if any errors occurred, we log that and exit prematurely with an exit code. Otherwise, we print the output of the command and exit gracefully. This works great on macOS. It's not particularly useful, but it works. It would also work on most Unix and Linux flavors. On Windows, however, it would not, unless run under Windows subsystem for Linux or maybe Sigwin. So let's modify our application a bit to make it work on Windows as well. We start by removing the static command params and instead feed the command params from an array or a slice. You might have noticed that we don't have any variable here called CMD params. Uh, to be able to have separate implementations for different release targets, targets we will use a concept called build constraints. We we'll create a file called main underscore Darwin, one called main underscore Linux, as well as one called main underscore Windows. The go build command will then pick up those suffixes and only include those files when building for that platform. But this is not really an ideal solution from an engineering perspective. We want to keep things dry as multiple copies of the same code increases the complexity and makes the project harder to maintain. So let's remove the Darwin and Linux files again and instead create a file called Unix-like. Unix-like does not mean anything to the compiler. However, by using an inline comment build constraint, like that, uh, slash slash plus, plus build, we're able to target all Unix-like OSs using one file while still having our odd duck windows uh, having its own implementation. Further, I'd like to talk a bit about Go Releaser. Go Releaser is a great tool for building all the combinations we want. Their single goal is to make build and delivery of Go binaries as convenient as possible. I, I'm in no way affiliated with this project. I, I just think they're doing a real good job in enabling fast and easy continuous releases. So this is the, this is the YAML file that we use for building and distribu distributing Watchtower. When Go Releaser is executed, it will create Windows and Linux binaries for AMD64, 386, ARM, and ARM64. Then it compresses each binary and uploads them to the Release tab of our GitHub repository, together with the changelog. It even produces Docker images that are uploaded to Docker Hub. There are a lot of additional features and options available that we're not currently not using, like uploading to S3 bucket, buckets or Artifactory. And this is what you get after a successful build. So let's recap. Go is statically linked, so no more dependency hell. We can, we can write once and build for everything. Build constraints further allow us to specia specialize our, what environment to build for and Go Releaser assist us in building for those targets. As some further suggestions, I'd like to suggest that you experiment with using Go to bootstrap your infrastructure. Use HTTP router, Jin, Mux, or similar to write HTTP APIs and deliver DevOps as an API service. You could also integrate it with chat ops for trig triggering through IM, say, for instance, Slack. And you could also use Ansible to deploy this everywhere, preferably even during the CI process. That was all. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Does anybody have questions, maybe? Like any? For any question, you can earn this beautiful <laughs> gopher pin. So if no, uh, oh. Uh, uh.
actually uh, recently I tried some some DevOps, I don't know, pass, uh, like of developing myself as a developer. And uh, uh, I've seen only like examples in Python and all this stuff. And right now you're talking about Go. So my question is, do, do you see as a Go as a, as a new, I don't know, branch in developing as a, as a DevOps engineer? I mean, to use it as a main language for, for some DevOps tasks, I don't know. Yeah, for, uh, so the question was, if uh, DevOps is, if it's possible to use Go as a main language for DevOps. Yeah, like a standard, the, the new like a standard to use uh, the DevOps in DevOps. Yeah, I, I really think so. Uh, Go is uh, probably the best uh, suited language to work with, with DevOps tasks. As I said, because of all the other projects that are actively using it or are built upon it, upon it as well as the uh, lack of uh, needing to install dependencies before running. So yeah, I use Go every day for DevOps tasks. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, my question is that there are some uh, platform dependent uh, compilations because there are some libraries like different for different platforms. So uh, in this case, you need to build CGCI for different platforms. Don't you think it's like a, a difficult part of Go? So it's not like platform independent in sense of Java, for example. Uh, you're of course right. Uh, Java is probably a bit more platform independent in the sense that it runs in a JVM, right? So you get basically the almost identical environment for running your code uh, independent of what platform you're running on. But you get a level of abstraction by using the JVM. If you want to like uh, manipulate or read things directly from the OS or the underlying infrastructure, things start to become a bit complicated in Java as well. And you might have to do, do use different packages or uh, things like that to be able to read it. So I, I don't really see that Java solves that in a better way than Go. Uh, of course, it depends on your use case. But I would say that Go is simpler because you don't have to install, install Java. You don't have to keep up with Java updates. You don't have to risk the, the Java JVM running out of heap or <laughs> uh, other stuff that is common when running Java applications. Does that answer your question? You. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, as that, I wanted to uh, add additional information about this question. Uh, I think that the question was uh, about uh, CGO compilation uh, because uh, pure Go compilation uh, doesn't require any dependencies during build for any platform. But uh, when uh, building a Go application which depends on a CGO uh, package, uh, then you need to uh, build tools for C, C++ for the platform which mm. you need to build uh, the Go application. And uh, the same applies for Java, because uh, in Java case, this is a JNI uh, dependency, a native dependency uh, not written in Java. And uh, it also needs uh, additional care. And uh, it uh, also needs uh, to be uploaded, to be, to be built, and to be uploaded to the server to run. So uh, in this case, Go wins comparing to Java. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, even if you are using, uh, or s rather, my philosophy when it comes to DevOps and Go is that you should probably avoid using uh, C packages as, as much as possible. Uh, there are ex uh, most often there are excellent alternatives uh, written in Go. Due to uh, performance reasons, for instance, uh, uh, there is a, a ZSTD library written in, in C, and uh, there is no, uh, there is a, a, a ZSTD library in, written in pure Go, but uh, it uh, lacks uh, many features and it has uh, much worse performance comparing to C version. So, mm. uh, when you need to 
use the, the STD compression in your Go application, then you have to use CGO yeah. dependence. And in that case, my suggestion is that try to keep not using CGO as uh, your uh, main uh, main path and use only CGO as an exception when you really need it. Is anybody else? Okay, thank you, Simon.